We're live. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another live coaching call with Nito Marketing. We've got Kasim here, our co-founder, who is ready and excited to talk about website stuff. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I, this is maybe one of my favorite topics, but honestly, just because of how important it is. Um, yeah, so I really like, I like that we're here now. I was looking forward to this when I saw the coaching call schedule. I was like, we're going we're gonna to nail that one. Yeah, yeah. And you had a great conversation last week with a thought leader that you brought in who's not a Montessorian, but had some really great um, value to add. So tell us a little, give us a quick recap for those that didn't either get a chance to see it or weren't there. Tell us how that went. Sure. Uh, so Dave Albano came in. Uh, he's a high-end digital marketing consultant that just did me a favor and, and, and wanted to drop in and, and help teach us about websites. And what I really liked about what he said was uh, he focuses on the journey. As a matter of fact, he's doing a webinar. You might've gotten an email. He's doing an ad hoc webinar this coming Tuesday on um, the, I forget what he calls it, but it's basically a customer value journey. So how to craft the narrative that people go through is they're like weaving their way through your brand. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's so important because, you know, the website's supposed to kind of tell a story. And what's interesting about the story that they're telling is they're the main character in this story. You know, it's like this choose your own adventure, you know, those fun books you got to read when you were a kid. Um, mm -hmm. so we talked about that. We talked about the journey and then he did, uh, some hot seat stuff, which is awesome. And he critiqued some of our, our, our members' websites live. Um, and it was really funny because right after he did that, I got all these maintenance requests from some of our members saying, oh, we need our call to action above the fold. Oh, we need to be able to do this. Um, sure. what I liked about what he said is he didn't, none of it was like a massive redesign. You know, it was things like, Hey, I don't know what you want me to do here. Or, you know, the most important thing that you're saying on your website is three scrolls down. Let's bring this to the top. So you don't need to go and rebuild everything. Um, instead, like one of the things, Heidi, who's on the call right now, uh, she's done a phenomenal job with her website. It's amazing. Dave had very little to say that was critical. But what he did say is we were above the fold and he goes, okay, great. You got three above the fold calls to action. And yet it's hard for me to tell which one's the most important. Let's, let's highlight it. And Heidi's done a good job. She, I think in, I mean, it took her 45 minutes and she emailed me and she changed the color. It's called the isolation effect where your eye is going to go to the thing that does not match because oftentimes all we want is to blend. You know, you want everything to be aesthetically pleasing and for it to be beautiful. Uh, the issue with that though, is then it all flows in together and you, you don't, you don't necessarily see it. And so using the isolation effects allows you to say, hey, this button is important and it might not be quite as aesthetically pleasing, but um, actually on Heidi's, I think it looks really good, but it, it also draws people's eye. So Dave just gave some really solid advice that way, introduced the concept of, you know, how the website is, what did he say? The website is your most valuable employee. It works 24, 7, 365. It doesn't take a lunch or a break. And the way that I'd love for Montessorians to start viewing the website is as, as the beginning of the tour. Because when I talk to Montessorians, everybody's like, oh, just get them into the school. If you just get them into the school, they're ours. Like, they're going to fall in love with us. They're going to love what we do. And uh, I know that's true, but that's not the way that parents engage. They're going to go to your site first. So what we need to start thinking is the site's not just a brochure that they have that drives them to the school. The site is the first step into your school. And if you can think about the site as your school lobby was, you know, 20 years ago, then it sort of changes that frame a little bit and it puts people in a position where I think they're going to be more receptive to investing time into it. And you don't need to invest a lot of money. Website building now is easy. You know, we could right now live on this call, build a website in about a half hour. You can do it with Squarespace or Wix. We have a website builder that we give to our members. Um, but it's the time that it takes to really think about what it is parents need to see and hear and then craft that content. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, it ties into the steps that came before this one, you know, so story branding, parent avatar. Um, so while you were having that conversation, were you thinking about the other steps that came prior to this one? Well, and they came up all the time. Dave's, you know, I mean, he's a brilliant marketer too. And most of what I promote are, you know, I mean, he and I follow the same sources and, and steal from the same thought leaders. And so most of what we're promoting have, you know, it's come from very much the same pool. You can't build your website until you understand who it is that you're building it for. And we know that because we've seen websites, you know, so many websites are built for us. I go and, and I'm just as guilty as anybody else. I go up and, and build the website for my agency. And all of a sudden I realize I'm just talking to myself. You know, it's like, oh, I've been in business this many years. And this is what people are saying. Here are all the awards we want. And, and instead you need to, to keep your avatar in mind, keep your mission, vision, values in mind, keep the goal in mind. Um, so, you know, if you're jumping right into websites, I, I'd caution you about that and say, go back and listen to some of the other coaching calls. They're a little tedious but the foundation that you'll build is invaluable and it'll last forever. It's not like these are things that change. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's, it speaks to the, the way that we've set up the 12 steps of marketing, right? Like you really do need to go through step by step um, to, to get the most value of what it is that we're doing. So um, I'm excited to hear about like best practices and implementation. And it sounds to me that we've got, you know, both the aesthetics of the website, but also the, the story. Um, anything else that I'm missing there that we'll talk about? No, the customer value journey, I think, was, was a really important part. But we're gonna, we'll have a whole webinar on that on Tuesday. So I don't think we need to dive any deeper. We, we did have a comment from Vicki. She said, I was on the call last week. Can you share again uh, the school that Heidi's with? Because she wants to reference her website again as a great example. Uh, Heidi's with Crystal Lake Montessori. Um, she's one of our star members. She's actually written some of the content that's in our members area. So if you happen across the content, make sure to thank her. And I'm just going to share my screen real quick because I think this is a great way to start this conversation. Heidi's done an excellent job with this site. It's clear, it's clean, it's easy to navigate. The content is exceptional. And this is what we were talking about, by the way. Dave came in and said, all right, great. You've got your calls to action. Which one's most important? And so Heidi turned this yellow. And I mean, look at your eye just goes directly there. It's so well done. Um, you know, image based. I just, I'm, I'm a really big fan with, uh, of, of what she's built here. So I'm, I'm, and I'm proud, you know, when, when she volunteered for, um, the hot seat, part of me was a little nervous because a lot of what we've done, you know, is, is been kind of a collaborative effort. And so I have, you know, something of call it like a 1% ownership stake. And, uh, it was really cool to see Dave have very little to say critically. It was just all compliments. No, from, from his point of view too, being like from the outside looking in as far as the Montessori world, did he have anything to say about the messaging? Like, was it clear? I mean, not specifically to Heidi's website, but, but also Montessori in general, was it clear for him to understand what it is that we're offering? He, the, I don't know if this was a positive or a negative, but he actually homeschooled his kids and he and his wife decided to take a Montessori approach. So he understood Montessori as well as somebody who's gone through that process. And I understand that there's an issue there that might not be aligned from a paradigm perspective, but, but he knew enough to have like, you know, read the book, so to speak. Um, so we didn't dive into messaging a lot in terms of critique outside of, of calls to action. I think one place where I might depart from Dave, and I would say this if you were on the call, of course, um, as a, as a, direct response marketer, Dave wants to go straight for the conversion. So everything that most marketers that, you know, kind of live in the B2B world, the business to business world, everything that they do is like, I just need to, I need to move you down my funnel um, because we're going to maximize the efficiency of this relationship where my departure happens is when I realize that moving you down the funnel is actually keeping you on my site, reading and educating. And that's, it's mm -hmm. funny you brought that up, Deneen, because that's the, the first topic I want to talk about, which is engagement. I think that we need to, to work very hard to bring a lot of content onto our site and answer, answer questions for parents. Yeah, well, and if we look at who, who we're working with and for, right, is the parents and their world is very confusing right now. So engaging them and having content that is engaging so they stop what they're doing for a few seconds and and look at it and take it in uh that takes time and nurture. absolutely so cool well do you want to go right into it then yeah so here's what i'm doing is i'm, I'm reviewing uh, a piece of collateral that we've pushed across often called the 16 must haves of every Montessori website and i'd like to go over it and then maybe offer some examples um and if you can visit this piece of, of collateral i'll drop it in the chat and then i'll also make sure that it's included in the video description if you're watching the recorded version um, but it, what's funny is we wrote this two and a half years ago in, in some variation and it's just never changed. That's not to say that it won't, but that's just to say that I actually really like the fact that these, these appear to be something of, you know, like archetypal principles. Um, there are things about websites that will of course come and go based off of functional requirements. But, uh, what we're trying to do here is put forth the evergreen, you know, these, these are the elements of the site that we just are always going to need to have. Uh, and we have them broken down categorically. Um, and so the, the very first category that I'm going to touch on is engagement. Um, a lot of schools are, I think, afraid, and Deneen maybe qualify this, this comment for me and tell me if I'm correct or incorrect, but a lot of schools are afraid to present content because it's kind of this weird decision that you're in. Like, all right, if I start explaining Montessori, then I've got to encyclopedia this thing and explain all of it. 
or I can just say, hey, come in and I'll tell you. But you know, they're, they're, they're worried about taking a half step or a half measure. Is that, is that fair, a fair statement? Yes, um, because it's hard to put it in a box, right. <laughs> what it is, right? Because you can, you're, you're trying to pull out certain elements of what Montessori is. But if you do that, then you put yourself at a risk of, of the parent filling in the story based on the research they find online, which is, you know, some is really great, some is not. Um, so that's a scary thing to step into. But I will say I have noticed schools doing more of that and, and seeing that it's really successful for them, mm -hmm. right? Because then it helps you really understand who you are and what you're offering and the language can be the same both on your website and the communication you have with your prospective parents your current parents that relationship building so yeah i think you're right but i think people are starting to be more <laughs> attuned to to changing that that's great and you said something that i want to touch on that if if we don't speak to montessori principles or, or the montessori method someone else will and chances are it's, you know, Wikipedia or my.ideas.about.montessori at blogspot.com or whatever. Um, yeah. You know. I will say, though, there's a lot of really good resources out there right now, um, like blogs and Facebook groups that are offering parents that want to know more about Montessori some, sure. some alignment for what it is. So even having something like that on your website, right, having resources that parents can go to to learn more so that they can fill in the story and maybe you're not necessarily the story giver, but you're giving them the skeleton, the tools, the keys, Montessorians call, um, to be able to build that story and fill it in. Um, I think that's a possibility too and I don't mean to like that's what you're probably going to talk about that later but I feel like that could be a really great opportunity well no that's great it, you know it, it, it's a point that I make elsewhere but I think it gives you the opportunity be, to be the source of the source it's so interesting because if I come to you and say hey I think this blank well then now you're you're sort of vetting the idea through a different lens than if I say hey this thought leader over here thinks this um, mm -hmm. it, it, it substantiates and maybe it shouldn't but this is just the way I think psychology works it substantiates the idea um, by one, you know, one standard degree of variation. So uh, I love what you just said, linking to the content. You don't have to recreate everything by any means. I do like to keep them on our site. So as much as is possible, I want to make sure that we're not losing the traffic because people have, you know, they're like goldfish when they're online, like just really <laughs> short memories and attention spans. And, and I know that because I'm sort of like that too. Speaking of my Slack is going off, so I'm going to go silence it, forgive me. Um, but we want to keep them on our site and we want to be able to control the narrative as much as is possible. Uh, but what I wanted to get at is we want content specific to what it is that they're searching for. So you don't have to describe the entire Montessori method. Here's what I think you do have to do, though. You have to describe the programs. Because if I'm a parent, I'm shopping for a product. And that product is the specific program that I'm going to be enrolling my son in. And I need something. It doesn't need to be all of it. You don't have to tell me. You know, I mean, it could be a day in the life if you wanted to get fun. Um, but it, really, more than anything, and we talked about this uh, on another coaching call, you need to talk about, I think, the, the benefits, not the features. The features confuse and require even more content. Uh, the benefits though, like, you know, your child is going to learn what leadership really means. Your child's gonna learn how to direct their own education in ways that, you know, they wouldn't in traditional. And, and, and those types of things catalyze further questions that then put somebody in a position to say, gosh, I really need to go see this and, and, and look more at it. So as long as the content is speaking towards, and again, this is where we, we talk about, you know, am I, are you making the website for you or are you making the website for your customer? Um, if the content can speak towards what it is that the parent gets or what the child gets, uh, then I think that that's the type of content we should all feel very safe producing because you're not going out on a limb and giving a half-hearted effort at, you know, explaining the Montessori method. Instead, you're just letting them know, this is the value proposition. This is why you need to come in and tour. And then any follow-up question, then you get to start to kind of forgive the analogy, but reel them in, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think you're absolutely right. You have to be able to describe your programs so that a parent, whether they're a parent of a three, four, five, eight year old, they can visualize them. So, like you are offering now a product that they need um, at the time that they need it. Mm -hmm. So being super clear about what your programs are um, is going to make it easier for your, your prospects. And we have program content in the needle marketing members area in the resources area. So I, I won't tell you that it's perfect because it's not, it needs to be customized to fit your school but we've got a uh, uh, downloadable program content that at a minimum will just help kind of spark your creative juices. Um, 
so make sure you have content and I would have content on a per program basis because each program is so unique. Um, I've noticed that some schools will kind of offer like the generic, you know, here's what happens when you, when you join us. But I, I think the disadvantage there is we're not setting the precedent that we're, we're a full system of education. You know I mean? So many schools come to us and say, Hey, we have a really hard time with retention. You know, we have a really hard time maintaining people through the kindergarten year. We have a really hard time convincing parents of the importance of the three year cycle. Well, this is where that starts. We start planting the seeds now to say, you know, here are the programs, here are the layers, here are the phases. Um, Heidi and I are actually working on a really cool graphic that maybe I'll share that kind of sort of visually articulates that. But however it is that you do it, start planting the seed now that we have a plan. And this plan is for you because if, if we don't let parents know, then they're going to assume that we don't have one. Because if you have one, why wouldn't you share it? You know, I'm thinking too, because I'm a very visual person, wouldn't it be neat? And I don't know if we have this in our new templates, but um, having a sequential way to lay out the program. So when from start to finish, so it's super clear and linear about like when we, we go from toddler to primary to elementary to adolescence and just kind of have that in a sequence, That's laying brilliant. it out on your website. I think that would be really neat because it gives the impression that like you're an entire program and then depending on where the parent is at, you know, they'll click on, let's say primary, but they'll see that there are other programs before and after so you can kind of see where you're at in the process. I love that. Heidi had a, a very similar idea with the graphic that sort of shows each of the phases and then you highlight the phase based off of where you are and you can use it both digitally and in you know, print collateral. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, this is the phase that we're in and, and coming up next. And what I think of what's cool about what you just said is it, it, it also arms you to have the discussion about what is to come. Um, and you want parents thinking that way for multiple reasons. You want it there's enlightened self-interest there because you want to be able to speak to retention, but you also want to let them know, I'm not just solving your today problem. I'm solving your next, however many years problem. Like this is, this isn't, you're not just dropping your kid in my lap to keep me, you know, safe and fed and happy and warm. We're helping turn them into the leaders of the future. And this is the way that we're doing it. Uh, and the fact that we have this plan, I think needs to be very clearly articulated on the website. And I think that's done tangibly through the programs page. The programs page, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's like a linear timeline, like you just said, and maybe we can make that even more, more clear and more apparent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How does that land? Is that effective advice? I think so. What are our, about our listeners? We've got quite a few here today. Yeah, we've got a good. A good about websites. Awesome. And just a quick note, if you're watching live on Facebook, that's awesome. Thank you so much for being here, but you always get to engage with this uh, directly if you come over to um, the, the webinar. So it's uh, needlemarketing.com forward slash coaching. And uh, that's where we do all of our Q and A. So if you're wondering why we're not responding to you, it's because we're not watching because there's too many things to watch. Um, I want to share a quick program page. And this is our uh, founder, uh, Matt Hillis. This is his website, which he designed. I mean, he didn't build, but he had designed. Um, and I think it's a really good example of, of the beginning of a program page. So I'm on his infant page just because that's the very first one. And what I like already is he's beginning to establish the narrative. And so it's letting parents know, you know, we've got you covered at each of these, each of these phases and each of these cycles. Um, and then it's, you'll notice it's a little repetitive, but I feel like that's important too, because you want to kind of drive home the, the more important facets. He uses social. No, and something awesome, sorry. Um, oh, it's something super simple, but really helpful um, is having the age range. I see a lot of websites where we just have the title of the program, but not the actual age range. And so that's an example of like insider language, right? You'd have to be familiar with the setup of your of Montessori programs to be able to understand that. And going back to the very first step of story branding, we don't want to confuse because that's when we lose. So, you know, can you go back to the program sure. list? Something as simple as including the age range can be can help your prospects near um, go through your website a lot easier and, and figure out what they need when they need it. Absolutely. And you said something that I think is really important to Nina about insider language. We had a phone call with one of our members. Um, it was earlier this week and we were going over all of our Google ad search terms. And um, she said something really insightful. She goes, you know, our parents don't know what primary is or what that mm -hmm. means. They search for pre-K. Right. And or we don't want, yeah, or preschool. Yeah. And we don't like the term pre-K because it's not, you know, it's not pre-K. It's so dismissive, isn't it? To just say it's like, oh, it's before real school. Um, right. <laughs> so but, but we need to meet them on their level first and then work to sort of elevate their thinking in a way. 
Um, so just, you know, understand that that's where parents are. So, you know, where nobody would know what primary is, the minute you put three to six years, it's like, oh, you mean pre-K. And then we get to go in and correct them. Yeah. Same thing with toddler too. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, if I say toddler, toddler, it, yeah. four-year-olds sometimes feel like toddlers. So like you can extend that out, you know, like, but it's, it's really just a matter of, of putting them in a box so you can explain a little bit more. Absolutely. Um, looking at this program page, I noticed that Matt uses social proof on every page uh, and his social proof is specific to that program. So I'm on the infant page and you'll notice that Anne here is uh, infant based testimonial. If I go to the toddler page, it's a different quote and it's not a string of scrolling quotes because what's really interesting, there's something in, in digital marketing that we call banner blindness. Anytime you see scrolling elements, we just ignore it. And, I, and we see it time and time again, because we have the functionality that allows us to, to monitor uh, what it is people are doing on, on browsers, which is really creepy, but also very cool. And anytime there's scrolling uh, imagery, um, this doesn't, it's not quite as applicable for videos, but anytime you see scrolling imagery, people tend to go banner blind. Um, go ahead and, and, and embed a quote, but make it your most impactful quote. Uh, and make sure if you can, that it's applicable to that specific program. And I think where Matt has it top, you know, front and center, that's by intention. He wants to let you know we have a significant amount of pro social proof and it applies specifically to you. Uh, mm -hmm. And then this is what I was referring to when I was talking about the benefits over features. Um, now, you know, adults one to three is a feature, but then the way that he articulates it, I think is benefit based. Um, and, and his language is, is really well done and, and all geared towards benefit based. He's not here to teach you Montessori. He's here instead to teach his prospects what it is that Montessori offers their children. And again, speaking to the narrative, at the very end of infant, it's like, oh, ta-da, now we go straight to toddler. And you'll notice that he does the same thing in toddler. It's, it's going to forward on to the primary classroom. Um, so that's, you know, make sure that you have robust program pages, make sure that we're speaking to uh, uh, the benefits of those program pages, and then make sure that people are understand that Montessori brings with it a narrative. And I think that's the, the advice that I'd offer on the, the content. How did I do there, Deneen? Yeah, no, I think that's great. And again, you're bringing them through a story, you know, and that's something we're really good at is telling stories. So this is perfect. Cool. I, I don't know that we're going to get to all 16 of these items. So I'm going to just maybe cherry pick a little bit. Is that okay? Sure. And I don't know if there's also, I, I guess I'd have to pull it up, um, themes of each one. You know, or do you feel like each one is in isolation? What do you mean? Sorry. Let me look at, um, so engagement. Did we talk through engagement? Well, I, I went to content first because that's where the conversation headed, but engagement's definitely on my list. Okay. Uh, yeah, because we've got themes here. I think we'd be able to move through the themes pretty, pretty well. I think so too. And the nice thing about engagement is it's, it's largely technical. Um, I think one of the single most important facets of engagement is treating your website, assuming your website is a person and not a brochure. And if your website was a person, your website should be equipped to do a few different things. So somebody comes and visits somebody. Um, let's say you had like, you know, a front desk person that, that didn't know everything about Montessori, but was adept enough to, to, to operate a few different pieces of functionality. They should be able to offer a leave behind. Like this is something that you might need in the future. They should be able to give them what the person needs to purchase or whatever purchase intent content is available. They should be able to schedule the follow-up. Um, they should be able to ask for more information potentially. And, uh, in, and I'm not trying to make this ridiculous, but, but your website should be at least that adept. And so what we have from an engagement standpoint, the number one most important thing that we have just seen operate. I just took a website live yesterday and, and she emailed me. She goes, Oh my goodness, I'm already getting tours. It's to let people schedule tours online. Especially if your school has been around for a while, you're getting traffic just by proxy. The fact that you've been around for a while, Google likes you and you would be shocked or maybe you wouldn't, but uh, parents actually want to engage, but they want to engage on their terms. So the call to schedule a tour, eh, I don't know. I, you know, I mean, chances are I'm looking at you after hours and you're not even available anyway. And also, Millennials don't like picking up the phone. There's data on this. They're, they're digitally uh, uh, enhanced people. Um, and the other piece of it too is just filling out a form to schedule a tour. What you're doing there is you're opening a loop. 
So if you think about your own mind and all the tasks that you have to accomplish and all the things that you have to do, and when I fill out a form to ask you to schedule a tour with me, all I'm doing is opening the loop to an open-ended task, and I have no idea how painful this is going to be. And we've all been in that email train where it was like, oh, can we do tomorrow? No, tomorrow doesn't work. How about Wednesday? Yes, Wednesday's great. Oh, sorry, since you and I spoke, I've already scheduled Wednesday. How about Thursday, et cetera, et cetera. Just throw up. And it doesn't have to be Calendly. It can be anything. There's Calendly and Schedule Once and Acuity Scheduling. If you're using the Montessori CRM by Needle Marketing, we have our own scheduling application now. Um, it, it, it's not as scary as it sounds. So a lot of the schools that we talk to are like, oh, well, we don't want people to be able to schedule tours when we don't want them. You get to define all the rules. So when they can schedule tours, you get to integrate it with your Google Calendar to make sure that it checks your calendar first for any conflicts. Um, you get to require a certain amount of time out. You can add, require padding in between different tour times. But what it does is it allows you to get parents into the school in a way that's not manual. And it, it, just, it just takes this bottleneck that you have right now in terms of getting people, because the most important thing you want to do is get them into the school. That's what everybody says. Just get them into the school and they're going to fall in love. Well, like, let's open this ability to get them in. And, and the easiest, best, most effective way to do that is Calendly or something like Calendly. I'm not a Calendly promoter per se. I, I, I like them and their, their free version is very robust. But um, allowing online scheduling on your, on your site, I know it's painful in some instances. And we have had, you know, customers say like, oh my goodness, this has been hard because, but usually it's, we don't know how to manage all of this, you know, which I think is a really good problem. So that's engagement item, absolute number one. Deneen, from your perspective, because you've managed a lot of this, what are the, like, talk me out of this or maybe challenge me a little bit. What are the reasons that you think that this could be an issue or, or, or risks that people need to be aware of? Um, well, so it's, it's just one other thing to manage, right? Like it's live. So you're connected to it. Well, it's connected to your schedule. So you just have to make sure that it's updated because right. people can schedule immediately. You know, they can schedule at 1 a.m. if they want. And you don't have to be awake at 1 a.m. to field that schedule. But you do need to keep it updated um, and work within your time frame. I think sometimes it's hard to put put your tours in a box. So have a schedule, right? So like every Tuesday, Thursday, or however, um, some schools will schedule tours based on each particular uh, prospect. Mm -hmm. So, and their schedule. So there's more of that um, personal touch to it. So it can be tricky to put people into calendars. Um, let me think if I can, I don't know, maybe some of our members have some other ideas that might come up where it's like, oh, I'm not really sure I want to actually just do this instantly. Another thing I can think of is we want to interface with them first before they commit to a tour. Sure. But, and I actually had that a year ago uh, where I was like, oh, but we want to talk to them first. I actually realize now, especially having the data we do where a lot of schools have done this, that this just makes your life so much easier. You know, like the, it's because you can always follow up right after right. and do the, the relationship building right after they schedule. And it's, it's actually better to do that because they've committed. Like you've already gotten the stuff out of the way of offering them to come in for a tour. Now it's really talking about what are you looking for? Um, this is, you know, what we offer. Here's the tuition. Here's the information we have. I can't wait to see you next week or whatever. So it just changes the conversation and actually makes it a bit easier on us. Absolutely. And I like what you said about the follow-up. We in, in the Monastery CRM, we have a pre-tour nurture. So you schedule a tour with me and then I send you an email and I ask you to fill out our pre-tour survey, um, which is five questions. And those five questions, by the way, are pre-qualification questions. So I say, hey, I want to be able to customize this tour to suit your needs and and you know, we want to maximize the value of our time. But really we're saying, are you mission appropriate? And I don't think I don't think it's a breach of etiquette to follow up and say, hey, I went over your answers, really appreciate you filling out the survey. I just wanted to make sure that we're, we're the right fit. Um, let's talk about, you know, item number three and why, you know, this, this might not necessarily be aligned. So you can still get them to schedule a tour and then you have the opportunity to, to kind of, you know, now it's on your grounds and playing on your level. So um, is, you know, as long as that system is in place. Uh, I've got a question in the Q&A. This comes from Susanna. Uh, what are your thoughts on counting these optional spaces for asking for more information? Uh, for example, what are you looking for? Uh, and what are you looking for in a school for your child? Sorry. Is it another roadblock to scheduling? What a great question, Suzanne. I appreciate this. So the short answer is yes. Uh, statistically, every form field you add decreases conversions by 11%. And that comes from HubSpot. So every time we add another form field, you're going to decrease the number of people that convert. 
Uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. Matt did it intentionally. So Matt was getting way too many tours, um, which sounds like a good problem to have, but they were coming in and they weren't mission appropriate or they were coming in and, and, you know, I mean, they weren't necessarily aligned from a vision standpoint or they weren't showing up, which is blogging up his calendar. And so if we're desperate for admissions, I'd probably recommend keeping it pretty sparse. And I, I hope I'm, I don't want to use the word desperate, but you know, I mean, if that's like a really important thing, I think that it, it probably is worth investing in getting people into the school first. But if you're in a position where you're like, gosh, this is a little overwhelming. I think adding form fields as pre-qualifiers is a good idea. Uh, and the one that Susanna just wrote out too, you know, what's important for you in a school. I think that's a great one. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a good, you know, gatekeeper, so to speak. Um, and allows you to customize the tour experience to suit their needs. Uh, whether or not you put that, the prequel on the front or the back is completely up to you, but I think that adding more form fields can be, can be a good thing. Was that a fence sitting answer? <laughs> no, I don't think so at all. And she had asked if it improves the gateway. So I think you answered that well. Yeah, well, the other thing too is, I, I think in some instances, parents might take you a little bit more seriously. Um, you know, if you just ask for name and email and then I get to schedule a tour, then it's like, all right, well, I'll see you there. But if you're asking for some information that makes me feel like, oh goodness, you, you, you really might be contextualizing this to my experience, then, you know, it might, it might improve the experience for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's again, clarity. I'm such a huge proponent of clarity, clarity, clarity. So you get to really hone in on the aspects that parents are looking for. So you can create that conversation and have a framework for it. Absolutely. Oh, another Q&A. Susanna says, thank you, so totally makes sense. Awesome. Um, the next item I wanna talk about is lead magnets. We run Google Ads for, I think, near 30 schools now, which is a small slate for an agency, but it's, you know, I, I think it's really important. And we've been inside the Google Analytics of, I mean, it's incalculable at this point, um, how, how many schools. And I can tell you that the schools with conversion actions are the schools that perform the best. As a matter of fact, we don't have a single school running Google ads who has, who's been compliant with our conversion action recommendations, who isn't doing very well. And now I'm not selling you on Google ads. That's not what we're talking about. Google ads is just the tool with which we use to measure the efficacy of a website because it's, it's a really concentrated ecosystem, right? We're taking all of this traffic and we're paying for it and we're like artificially boosting engagement and schools that have conversion actions are schools that perform well. And a conversion action, by the way, is just something to do. So my favorite one is a high value lead magnet. We have a ton of resources in the resources area that are available to you. Um, one of the highest performing right now is six reasons Montessori will work for your child. Make a lead magnet available to people who land on your website and make it an ever present offer. It doesn't need to be intrusive. I like little pop-ups that show up on the side of the window because it's not even covering content, but it's just like, Hey, we have this free white paper. If you're interested, we'd love to send it to your email. Um, and if you know, you don't like that particular lead magnet, come up with your own. There, there could be, you know, a checklist, a calculator, a download, but something of value. And it needs to be a real value that you send to this parent that gives them the opportunity to convert before they're ready to talk to you. Because statistically 99% of all traffic is not ready to talk to you yet. Um, which, you know, adjusted for some margin of error means everybody. So nobody who comes to your website wants to talk to you, but what they will do is they'll take you up on an offer like that. And the pushback that we get all the time, and Deneen's heard it as much as I have, if not more, is, well, I don't like giving my email to people, so I don't want to give, you know, I don't want to ask for it, or we don't like adding a gate. Um, I think that that's, that's a fair critique and fair criticism, but I, I, I want to recontextualize the way that we're looking at this in our mind. This is the most important thing. This is one of the most important decisions that they'll ever make in their entire life. And you're offering them a piece of clarity, and you're going to send it to them through a marketing mechanism that they can opt out at at any time. If they're not willing to give you their email, then maybe they're not mission appropriate. So I think adding a lead magnet to your site and making it ever present is, is a critically important facet of, of the website must haves. Danina, I feel like I'm monopolizing this conversation. Forgive me. How do you feel about the, the lead magnet thing? Yeah, no, I love it. Um, and I feel, you know, with the people that I've talked to, I, it's well received and there's so many resources in our section for you to diversify your lead magnets. Um, in a way that really makes sense and speaks to your school. And it's also like you're not obligated to, to follow up with them, although it is in our best practices. But if you have a pushback on, you know, like you prefer to just give it to them and then they have it and then they can come back, you know, it's, it's the ball's in their court now, right? Mm. Um, but we at least know and have that information so we know whether it's working or not. Because that's another thing. You have to know if what we're doing is working and capturing the attention of the people we, we want to capture attention with. Absolutely. 
Heidi just chatted in and said, what I learned from Dave is the problem is not email nurture, it's providing really valuable content. And Dave touched on this uh, last week. I, thank you for that, Heidi. I appreciate it. There's nothing more deflating than signing up for something. And when you get it, you're like, oh, you tricked me. Or, mm -hmm. oh, that wasn't that good. Or, oh, I could have just Googled that. So make sure what you're sending them is something that really fulfills on the promise. And, and Dave walked through this really valuable lesson of continuity. If my offer says, hey, would you like to download our, our Six Reasons Montessori will work for your child? And you say yes. Then the thank you page should say, great. Thank you so much for requesting the Six Things Montessori. Check your email. It's going to be there. And then the email subject line comes up and says, you know, here's your free white paper, the six things. And what you're doing is you're reinforcing that if I tell you I'm going to give you something, I'm going to give you something. And if we can sort of build that, that, you know, kind of relationship with people, then it builds trust. Um, and Heidi chatted back in, it's only spam if it's not valuable. And I, I really believe that. So to everybody who says, oh, I never give my email out. That's not true. And I don't want to get too <laughs> combative on this call, but we've all got at least one thought leader that we really enjoy hearing from. I really love, I'm a Patreon supporter of, uh, of Brandon Stanton, Stanton, whatever his name is, the uh, Humans New York kid. You know what I'm talking about? Um, he, oh, he does. He has the Facebook page. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. So I love his emails. They're amazing. The, the one yesterday blew me away. It was an 11 series, you know, and that was the Facebook post, not the email. But I really like hearing from Brandon because what he gives me, you know, what he sends me is really valuable. Um, I actually like hearing from my, my children's school when they send us things that are, that are relevant. Every now and then they'll say like, oh, it's Chipotle night. And I don't know that I want to engage with that as much. But um, there are people that you enjoy hearing from. And if you think about why you enjoy hearing from them, it's because what they're sending you is relevant to you and it's valuable. So use a lead magnet and then make sure that you're actually emailing these people. If they don't want to subscribe, they can unsubscribe. And by the way, it's okay to prompt that. We always like to pretend like the unsubscribe button isn't even there. You know, we're like scared little rabbits just like dancing around it. Come right out and say, hey, by the way, if we're sending you anything that's not relevant, feel free to opt out, please. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to spam you. So we're going to continue to use your email until you tell us otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. The old marketer's mantra is buy, die, or unsubscribe. I don't think we're going to go that far, but you know, something along those lines. Well, another part of it too is like these parents deserve to have the information that we have to give them. You know, like we have such unique programs um, and really this education style is unlike any other. And so the content and the people and the community we have, they deserve to know about. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you had said this, Kasim, like they deserve to have information from us in their email box because everyone else is getting there and they deserve to have something that is incredibly valuable and attached to you know, their child's experience that's going to really give them something more to look forward to. Um, and, you know, this will be the next step, steps, or is step eight, establishing thought leadership. Um, that's another part of our 12 steps of marketing. It's like so huge to be able to do that. And this is just one little piece of the puzzle. Yes, ma'am. Um, Susanna just typed in about the Humans in New York piece and said that she loved it too, by the way. So if you didn't check out Humans in New York yesterday, Today's February 6th, so go check out February 5th. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice, heartfelt little piece. Um, I want to talk a little bit, and this will be the last piece about content, but you have to tell them about you. Uh, what we find for parents, um, because there's what's called a conversion path. So people don't come to your website and schedule a tour. That doesn't happen. They come to your site and they leave. They come to your site and go to your blog and leave. They come to your site and go to Facebook page and leave. They go to the Facebook page and come to your site and they leave. And we know this because Google Analytics shows us this. There's something called a conversion path. And when you see it, like it shows these little tendrils that are going out, showing you know, where people went, how many times they engaged. And you realize like, oh my goodness, they've been engaging with me for six months or nine months or 18 months. The question to ask yourself then is, is there enough content on your website for somebody to engage with over the course of an 18 month period? And if the answer is no, then you might be boring your parents, number one. Number two, after they have learned about what's in it for them, then they actually want to learn about you. Um, so start with the, the benefits to them, of course, but what we've found is for people that have long session lengths, meaning they've been on your site for a long time, the highest traffic pages tend to be about the school mission, vision, values, school photos are huge. They're huge. Staff photos and bios are huge. I want to know who my child's going to be with all day. Like that's so critically important to me. I realize that there's a logistical hurdle here in getting pictures. And I want to tell everybody that if your phone is not 20 years old, you have a, a good enough camera in your hand. So if your phone was purchased, honestly, in the last like three years, like, I don't know, every single one of these phones are amazing. The iPhone's camera, I think is like, you know, 
I forgot what the data point was, but it was like a $3,500 camera three years ago or something. So mm -hmm. all you want to do is make sure it's not shaky, throw it on a tripod, take some pictures of your classroom in your school. Something is better than nothing. It doesn't have to be professional photography. If you can afford professional photography, trade for professional photography, that's great. If you can't, go out there and get some images and some videos of your school because people want to see it. Um, and, and, and not doing so, I think, is a catastrophic error. Stock photos are a turnoff. I feel like you're hiding something. Um, and I'm saying that as somebody, we offer stock photos on our site. And I think you should use them. You can use our photos for, you know, your marketing. But when, when it comes to about you, like, people really want to know who you are. And so I, 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 I'd encourage everybody to spend some time talking about where they came from, what they're trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish, what their school's about, what the story is, and then, and then you know, build up your staff profiles a little bit. Yeah. What are your thoughts on videos, too? I love them. Um, people need to be comfortable on video. So I don't like forcing, you know, we've got, I've got 16 employees at Solutions 8 and, and some of them are, you know, all about being on video and some of them have, have something of an issue with it. Um, and so if you can get, if you can, honestly, all you need is one, if you can get one really like that sort of loquacious uh, 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 front facing like person that likes to be on video, I'd, I'd make them the face um, and, you know, have them walk around and introduce the, the school or, you know, and then short little snippets are really fun too. Heidi actually made a couple of videos using um, just imagery. She had imagery and then text going over the overlays, which is nice too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can also narrate it. If you really can't find somebody who's comfortable in video, you just make videos of your school and your environment and have somebody narrate it from the back end. Uh, Jalila is asking, what do you suggest a brand new school should do about photos? Stock photos are the only option. In that case, use our photos. So uh, if you're a member of Nino Marketing, um, we have Montessori specific photos. And what's nice about those, and we actually just loaded up some more, I'll share my screen, and my little guy's in them. Um, and Deneen's little guy's in them too. Uh, are they He's not so little anymore. <laughs> <laughs> not so little. So there's Deneen's son, this is my son. Um, but we've got some Montessori specific photos. So there's photos about materials. Um, you know, we have our material photos, photos of children's with guides, uh, photos of children groups, photos of children's solo children's children solo um but you know try to in as much as is possible not to just go take the the example that we use in the marketing world is the two people in suits shaking hands like you just don't want to take the thing that's oh that's clearly a stock photo um so and if you're not using our stock photos then then try to find stock photos that you think kind of capture sort of you know the essence and theme of your school i think would be really important or even just um the stock photos and materials, you know, those are really great and really hard to come by if you're looking at like on Splash or something, right? Like those are tricky. So use those and then have a plan to be able to get pictures of your current environment when it starts to come into fruition. Right. I think that's helpful. Or even like grabbing a couple of pictures from there and then speaking to what the benefits of this particular environment offer is. Um, and then- I love that idea. Yeah. yeah, using the photo as a catalyst for content. I think that's brilliant. Yeah, you've turned me into a marketer now, Kossum. So. Hey, we did it. <laughs> um, we talked about social proof, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, I believe very strongly that everybody needs to have a blog on their website. You don't have to call it blog if you don't want to. You can call it news or updates or in the know or get to know us or, you know, whatever. Um, but the blog talking about that parent that's revisiting your site every day for 18 months, uh, that's where they're going to go eventually. They're going to start just on the, the generic site, go into the about us. But then after a while, when they exhaust all your other resources, the blog is where you go. And the nice thing about the blog is people are very forgiving with blogs. It doesn't need to be the most epically piece, you know, positioned piece of content in existence. It just needs to be continued value. And like Heidi said, as long as it's valuable, it's not spam. So blogs can be short. They can be quick ideas. It could be a video with just a little subtitle. It could be like Deneen said, you take a picture and you explain the picture. Um, what's nice about blogs is it's not just for prospects. It's also for your current parents. Uh, if you can get your existing parents to be going back to the blog, there's parent education and we're starting now. And so it's kind of this dual purpose. Um, Nito has blogs for you. So if you're a third or fourth play member, we write a blog for every week and the blogs are amazing. Um, the Christy, our writer is just brilliant. She's a trained Montessorian and they're, they're long. I mean, they're 16, 1700 words long sometimes. Um, if you're not a third or fourth play member, we have a course on creating a content schedule. Uh, and you don't have to create, you don't have to overwhelm yourself. I think one blog a month, I would call the minimum. Um, and if you can do one high value blog a month, then you're putting yourself in a position that I think elevates you above 
schools that aren't producing that type of content because now you're not just somebody trying to sell the parents something. You're a thought leader. You're a, um, a consultant kind of, what's the word I'm really looking for to mean? Um, an authority. You're an authority in your space. You sort of like, you know, you're, you're, you're providing information that transcends commerce now and just telling them here's, here's what's important to you. Um, and I'm saying, you know, what's really funny about this is the last blog we posted to needlemarketing.com was in November. So, yeah. Okay. Maybe Heidi can help you out with that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> she already did. She wrote a blog for me yesterday. She's amazing. Um, yeah. Heidi's going to own Nito in like four weeks. It's, it's not going to take long. Uh, I want to talk about some technical basics. Do we mind doing that? Is it, is it too important? Okay. So we have to be responsive. 50% uh, of your traffic, if not more, is gonna come in through a mobile device. So you want your website to respond to the size of the user's browser, and I'll show you exactly what that looks like here in just a minute. And as uh, you're pulling that up, um, Susanna had just chimed in. She, she said she, we really love the book list, so I was just talking about the content that we offer. Um, so every yeah. month we'll have a book list for parents and she said, we have several that talk about waiting for those each month. So you've got a following, which is exciting. And the Montessori Basics series is, series is also really great for sending links to after tours for parents that had a lot of questions about curriculum. That's, thank you so much for that, Suzanne. I appreciate that. We've got, check this out. We've got, it started in January, 2018. So we've got two years, two plus years of the content. And then, you know, here's the, here's the book list. Here's the Montessori basics. Um, and it's one for every week. So, you know, the schedule is, I don't want to say predetermined, but we, we assist. Uh, and let me just pull up this week's book list. And we'll just take a look at it briefly. Sorry to turn this into a sales pitch, but I'm just so proud of this content. I want people to know it exists. Um, well, and think about the topic, like cultivating resilience. Hello, that's what most parents are afraid about. <laughs> like, yeah. are our kids going to be okay in 20 years? Ah, you know? <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh, and by the way, I like to give away free things to people that show up live. So if you showed up live and you're not a member, um, uh, email me. I'll drop my, my email in the chat and I'll send you a free month's worth of content. And thank you for being here. Um, but I mean, this is 1400 words, you know, it's and, 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 and valuable, valuable stuff. Um, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, just going to drop my, do we just get another chat? Uh, no, I didn't think that one. That was Susanna's question. Heidi just shouted it and said, FYI, Beth includes oh. pictures of kids and parents, uh, of kids and parent read the blogs because of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, Beth includes pictures of parents and, oh, kids and parents read the blogs because of that. That's okay. That's brilliant. So I think what Heidi's saying is, is uh, including pictures of uh, your kids at school is probably going to increase engagement in the content. If I read that correctly, Heidi, let me know. And just drop my email here. If you want a free month of content, email me. Um, let's talk about websites. So we've got six websites that we offer our members. If you're on the second plane, you have access to this. It's uh, included with your package. Um, and this is a responsive website. So what's nice about this site is you can see what it's going to look like uh, on a desktop, which responds really well. And all of them do this. And then you can see what it looks like on a tablet. And this isn't exact per se, but it's you know a, a smooth enough rendition. And what you'll notice is it's the same site. So you don't have a separate desktop and mobile site and you don't want to do that. And the reason you don't want to do that is because Google is going to penalize you for splitting your traffic at, at, uh, into two different domains. And then here's what it looks like from a smartphone. Um, and again, you'll notice that this is actually really engaging. On a phone, you can do everything that you need to do, read all the content, take all the action, schedule a tour if you wanted to. So making sure that your site is mobile responsive is critically important. The menu is, is mobily uh, uh, engaged. Um, if you're not using our site and you don't want to, uh, a couple of options for you, I'd say would be uh, WordPress for sure, tends to be the gold standard. The issue with WordPress is it's difficult to manage. So if you have an in-house manager or somebody that can manage it for you, then I think WordPress is the recommendation. But other than that, I'd go look at Wix or Squarespace. I've been, I used to hate Wix, but they rebuilt their entire builder I think a year ago or two years ago, and it's amazing now. Um, they're very cost effective, very easy to use, and they have drag and drop builders. So it's, it's really easy to pull your site together, but make sure your site is mobile responsive. Any questions about that one, Deneen, before I move on? No, but we have data that most parents are looking on their mobile devices, right? So like that's a part of, of what we look at for reports and Google ads. 
um, and searching. And it's, it was something like 90%, right? Or like, I mean, it's really high for most people on their phones. That's 90% of all the traffic that lands on the site or 90% of all the conversions I think started with mobile. And then some of them, because conversion path is so long, some of them will transition over to desktop when they're doing in-depth research. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a significantly size. It's at least half of your traffic is mobile for sure. No question. Um, yeah. Well, and that's your first impression. You know, if that's where right. the journey begins, that's it. It's important to have it be responsive then. Uh, real quick note about website speed. I opt for speed over functionality all day, every day. So if you look at our, our templates, you'll notice that they're really sparse. There's not a whole lot going on, um, I think. Um, and that's by design. You don't want to overwhelm your site and, and slow it down because half of your traffic is mobile. Mobile ends up being a little bit slower because people are on you know, uh, a wireless internet connection. And so just make sure your site is fast. Make sure you're using an SSL certificate. Um, Google, for whatever reason, and I, honestly, I don't necessarily agree with this, because you don't have to have an SSL certificate on your site if you're not collecting sensitive data. But um, if you don't have an SSL certificate, there's a browser notification that goes off sometimes saying this site is not secure. And it just, it just plants the wrong seed, I think, in parents' mind. Um, your hosting provider can generally install that for you. Um, we talked a little bit about platform. And there was one more thing I wanted to touch on. Oh, make sure you can make changes on your own. So if you're choosing a platform, um, we have a, a school who's on a platform that I've noticed a lot of schools are on and I'm not going to poke it in the ribs because they're smaller and I don't want to disparage them, but I will say that um, it's really hard to make changes. And I mean, frustratingly so, it, so much so that we have to go back to their, their admins often. Um, and that's just not the way that websites can work. You need to be able to just jump in there and add stuff because your website has to be a living, breathing entity. Um, so make sure that the change is possible. Um, and I would call that the, the short list of the must haves. If you're interested in the full blog, I'll, I'll make sure that I post it in the, the description of this video. Any questions from our attendees? We got a great list of folks here. Thanks everybody for coming. Any questions, comments, concerns, or confessions? Anybody want to volunteer to do the hot seat next week? That would be a good one. Yeah. We might give like a really awesome thing to whoever volunteers. I don't know what it is yet, but I'll figure out something that's awesome. Oh, we've got a cue. Here we go. <laughs> Susanna wrote crickets. Susanna, she could be one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, all that means is we've answered all your questions because we're that well prepared <laughs> for this call. Uh, we do this every Thursday at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Don't forget, we've got a special um, coaching call coming up on Tuesday with Dave where he walks through the entire customer value journey. That might be 90 minutes long, by the way. So if you need to come and then exit at some point, we totally understand the recording will be made available. Um, he's also going to do a scorecard. And I know we don't like grades here, but it's, it's for his exercise. And he's going to let people present their scorecard live and then walk through that scorecard with them, um, which should be pretty cool. And that's, he's going to help you map out basically the parent journey. Um, oh, do we have another question or is that the same one? No, oh, I was wondering about consistency of the platform. So yes, ma'am, please. We have a lot of stuff that we share daily on Facebook that doesn't necessarily make a good blog post. Is it better to only post on the blog than share the link? No, I think that's such a good question. Oh, and then she followed up, or use multiple forums to have multiple ways to find us. Um, I think that Everything that goes on your blog should probably go on Facebook. So let people know we just posted the blog and, and drive them back to the site, but not everything that goes on Facebook needs to go to your blog. Uh, there's a temperament. There's a personality to every social channel. And I think that managing social channels is honestly really overwhelming. So what I recommend to my clients always is choose one, um, choose one social channel and commit to it. So if, if your channel is Facebook, then let's go all at Facebook. And I'm noticing a, a gradual but strong shift towards Instagram. So you might hear our narrative changing a little bit, but right now I'm still pretty bullish on Facebook at the moment. Um, but I don't think that you need to, um, I don't think you need to cultivate all of them. And then I also think that it's important to read the personality um, of your members and then know what's going to be applicable. Uh, and then Heidi just brought up a really good point. There's a WordPress plugin that allows your website to feed directly from Facebook. Um, which is really cool. But yeah, I, I, I think that, that Facebook can be very ad hoc. Uh, and the things that we've seen engaged the best on Facebook are just pictures of your kids. 
Uh, anytime you post pictures of students, you know, lights, comments, shares go through the roof. Um, and then when it's our content, which is thought leadership based, you're not going to get as much engagement. Now that content I think is still critically important because you're letting people know I'm an authority in the space. I'm here to help you. And, you know, I mean, people do read it, but they're not going to engage with it nearly as much as the, the feet on the street, you know, sort of in the trenches content. Um, I hope that it helped to answer your question, Susanna. Any other questions about websites or anything else? Oh, uh, Emily. Yeah, we got one. Emily said, I will volunteer to be on the hot seat, although I am terrified. This is great. I promise it will be an enjoyable experience. And uh, Emily, if you don't mind just chatting me your email, I will, um, I'm sure I have it, but I, I just, to, to make sure I have it, I, I'll reach out with um, uh, all the stuff to get you set up and we'll test your camera mic and all that good stuff. Um, and we'll have room for other hot seat folks too. So if anybody else wants to volunteer, um, we'll figure out exactly what to do. And uh, yeah, that's really exciting. Great. Well, I feel good. Deneen, do you feel good? Yeah. This is such a good topic and, and needed for sure. So remind me again, Tuesday, if people want to join the Tuesday conversation and the scorecard, do they get emailed the scorecard prior to the, to the conversation or how does that work? No, it happens live. So he's going to introduce the scorecard on the call. I don't think he wants much preface because he doesn't want to. Uh, it's going to be better, I think, if it's organic and if it's done alongside Dave. The, there should be an email. If you're a subscriber to Nino, there should be an email with uh, a link to, to join the call on Tuesday. If you don't have it, email me, please. Um, you can always get a hold of us, by the way. Just go to hello at needlemarketing.com as an email. Live chat us on the website. We're pretty quick to respond. Um, and that's the, the Tuesday call. It should be pretty fun. Yeah, I'm excited for it. Awesome stuff. Thanks, Denise. Thanks, everybody who joined us live, and we will see you next week. All righty. Sounds good. Take care.